Hello everyone, thank you for checking out my YouTube channel, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. My name is Nick Barksdale, and today I am excited to bring you... The Anarchy of King Arthur's Beginnings. The Politics That Created the Arthurian Tradition. Written by Andrew D. Pringle. This paper examines... Joffrey of Monmouth's Historia Regum Britanniae in a political and historical context to illuminate the 12th century politics that started the Arthurian tradition and show how those politics influenced later works about the legendary king. <laughs> This paper covers the transmission of politics in the Historia in three sections. A summary of the politics during the time Geoffrey wrote the Historia. An examination of the way those politics were integrated into the Historia. And finally, a consideration of how the political themes of the Chronicle have been transformed and changed through adaption. This paper sets out to show the influence the Historia's politics had on the King Arthur tradition and to argue that some features of those politics remain within the Arthurian literary tradition. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the anarchy of King Arthur's beginnings. The politics that created the Arthurian tradition. Geoffrey of Monmouth's historically inaccurate account of the first kings of Britain, the Historia Regum Britanniae, is famous for originating many well known stories of English literature such as Shakespeare's King Lear. The most enduring episode of Joffrey's pseudo-history is his story of King Arthur, which provides the first literary description of the legendary king and his rule. Joffrey took a folkloric Welsh king and transformed him into an imperial figure, establishing the literate Latin version of the Arthurian legend. Geoffrey's Historia was the first step in the Arthurian literary tradition, yet it was a tradition that Geoffrey may not have intended to begin. Considering Geoffrey's contemporary Britain and the content of the Historia, especially attending to events that have no historical basis and that may have been invented by Geoffrey himself, other more political motivations begin to emerge. The way Joffrey utilized these invented historical episodes, such as when the Briton kings conquer the Roman Empire, reveals political machinations hidden underneath Joffrey's express desire to write down the history of Britain's first Celtic kings. The Historia is rightly famous for its documentation of the legendary Arthur, but the politics that underlie Joffrey's creation deserve exploration as well. It is remarkable that one of English literature's most prominent characters arose from 12th century political observations that were imbued into the Historia's pseudo-historical account of a period set centuries before Geoffrey's own contemporary time. In this essay, I describe a connection between the political ideologies of Geoffrey's Historia and the literary tradition it began. Joffrey's Historia, when viewed in the historical context of the 12th century, has subtle objectives beyond Joffrey's stated purpose. 
to record the ancient Britain kings whose deeds are worthy of everlasting fame. Viewing Joffrey's writing within its larger political and social climate makes it hard to imagine that Joffrey sought only to be the progenitor of the medieval Arthurian tradition. Yet it is this contribution for which Joffrey is most remembered. I intend to show how Arthur transcended his creator and what politics from his Historia may still influence Arthur's tradition. I will do this in three stages. First, a summarized look at Joffrey's historical period, the Anarchy, to understand the contemporary events that influenced Joffrey's writings. Second, how the politics of this period manifest themselves within the Historia through the norms of 12th century Anglo-Norman society that Joffrey wove into his ancient setting, and finally discuss how the legend moved beyond Joffrey and demonstrate that the tradition retained some politics of his time, focusing on the one prominent example of Mordred's character. These three sections will show that the Arthurian tradition has outgrown both the Anarchy and Joffrey, such that it is difficult to find substantial connections between the Anarchy and later medieval Arthurian texts, let alone the modern adaptions of Arthur. Still, certain foundations, such as Mordred, remain centuries later as reminders of Arthur's political roots in Joffrey's Historia. Joffrey wrote the Historia during the events that would act as the prologue of the Anarchy, a series of civil conflicts that began with Stephen of Blois's usurpation of his uncle Henry I's throne, a throne declared to Henry's daughter, Matilda. After Henry I's death in 1135, Stephen consolidated power quickly, securing support from the church, nobility, and citizenry. The people of London specifically overwhelmingly supported Stephen and his rise to power, and his rule would prove to be an economic boon for the city. Stephen rallied his support and was crowned king in the same month that Henry I died, while Matilda had only been able to make it from Anjou to Normandy, not even into Great Britain itself, before her birthright was taken from her. It if need be, but I will not allow that which is mine, which has been the constant goal of my life to be snatched from my grasp. On the grounds of legitimacy, Stephen did have a right to the throne. He was a close relative of Henry I, the most fit out of his brothers to be crowned king. Let others rejoice, Griselda, not I. For my long-cherished hope of being my father's heir will perish if this young bride bears him a child. And I shall be merely an illegitimate son and my claim to the throne will vanish like a dream. Unless I strike like an arrow, swift and deadly. And to the mark! And a favored individual in Henry's court. What made Stephen's power grab problematic is that he had sworn an oath of fealty, along with other nobles, to Matilda after she was named Henry's heir. He had supporters who claimed that he was released from his vows by Henry I before the former king's death, but most knew that this was untrue. Matilda had her own supporters, but they usually came in the form 
of foreign powers, such as her husband, Joffrey of Anjou, and her uncle, David, King of the Scots. Welsh raiders and noble uprisings against Stephen, though unconnected to Matilda, probably served her cause as well. However, the support of London and other powerful nobles gave Stephen the domestic foothold he needed to retain his power for nearly two decades. The Historia's first appearance is dated to be around 1138, the same year that Robert of Gloucester, Joffrey's patron and illegitimate son of Henry I, defected to his half-sister Matilda's cause. Thus, it was completed before the battles that would mark the most turbulent years of the anarchy, but civil unrest was already in full effect. King David was the first to attack Stephen's kingdom after his coronation in 1135 and David would continue to be a thorn in the king's side for years to come. David's invasion of northern England marked the beginning of a long list of foreign aggressions and insurrections that defined Stephen's reign. Merlin, you, who are wisest in council, have said naught. You are the king, sir. That is my counsel. Aye, and with the crown and scepter, also the welfare of the kingdom was placed in my hands. You all think and feel like men. I must act with the mind and the heart of a king. One of the main causes for why this English historical period was branded the Anarchy, the latter part of 1138, saw Stephen suppressing rebellions that supported Matilda and the Angevin cause, as well as more localized uprisings. These smaller uprisings normally involve nobles who wish to settle disputes left over from Henry I's reign. Stephen spent the majority of his rule trying to maintain his power through constant campaigning. Yet he never quite established a nationwide peace. Because of these never-ending conflicts, historians have characterized Stephen's rule as weak and disorganized. To designate the term anarchy, to the conflict between Stephen and Matilda is somewhat misleading. However, as it is difficult to define this period as a civil war or even an anarchy, the term anarchy was not even associated with the period until William Stubbs applied it in the 1870s, more than 700 years after the conflict was resolved. Stephen's rule was not lawless as the title would imply. Although there were many insurrections during Stephen's reign, none of these became full-fledged civil wars. The period would even be more accurately described as a foreign invasion. Her half-brother Robert backed Matilda, but her main supporter was her husband, Joffrey of Anjou. The Normans and Angevins already had a deep disdain for one another, and this succession issue served as the perfect opportunity for Angevin intervention in Normandy and Britain. The Anarchy's conflict was eventually resolved with a truce between Stephen and Matilda, stating that Matilda's son, Henry of Anjou, would inherit the throne after Stephen. Henry did take the crown, as Henry II upon Stephen's death, beginning the Angevin line of kings. Therefore, the civil war technically ended with a foreign power wrestling control of Britain away from the Norman kings.
The Angevins did not even consider Stephen a proper ruler, being written off as an illegitimate ruler in their histories. The Treaty of Winchester, the document that ended the anarchy, acted to erase the anarchy, and by extension, Stephen's rule. It required that all castles built during the conflict be destroyed, and all the land confiscated by Stephen to be restored to those who held the land during Henry I's reign. Almost as if the treaty was meant to portray a history where the crown was handed directly from Henry I to Henry II without any interruption. The history of Stephen's reign shows that it is hard to define the anarchy as any one conflict. Much as it is difficult to define the exact purpose of Joffrey's Historia, despite the period's ambiguous nature, it is clear that there was civil conflict both before Joffrey wrote his chronicle and after it began to circulate, as is seen in Stephen's disregard for Henry I's command to put Matilda on the throne and countless noble uprisings. This period of history may not have been a true anarchy or even a true civil war, but it did see a time of massive civil unrest.